Thank you for taking the time to be here with us, Abdul. A lot of people have asked a lot of questions and it's a, uh, understandably, it's kind of a difficult and weird time for everyone. So I'm glad that they get a, a chance to directly engage with the leader. Well, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you having me. So thank you. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So a lot of people want to know that, you know, COVID-19 has been around for a while and they want to know if after we get past the first wave, if there's going to be a resurgence, if we're going to see it back in the winter, or if it's going to become thing become something like seasonal, like the flu, is that a possibility that we're looking at? Yeah. So, you know, the fact is, it, it you know, you said it's been around for a while. Like in scientific term, it's been around for like no time at all. Um, you know, six months is just nothing, uh, and that's as long as it's been in humanity. So we're still understanding it. From what we understand there is a distinct possibility that could it could go what we call endemic meaning it just hangs out and you know infects a certain number of people in whom it has a bad outcome every year the hope is that um it doesn't and there's a lot we can do about that and um it's going to take two things it's going to take um uh a massive access to testing and um and aggressive contact tracing and just for folks who don't know what contact tracing is it's the process of identifying who's exposed um, and then isolating folks uh, who test positive or uh, for whom tests have not yet resulted. And then um, and then just making sure that you're really aggressive about following up their contacts and their contacts and their contacts, contacts, et cetera. Um, that's the way we keep this thing down. And then, you know, of course, if and when we have a vaccine, uh, that would allow us then to ring vaccinate and uh, and bring it right down to zero. But there's a distinct possibility that we can't. And one of the challenges, right, was was uh, with the flu in particular is that you end up getting so many strains uh, and so much evolution that um, you can't identify all the possible strains for a vaccine. And you end up getting, you know, new evolution every year and new strains. And so you're constantly uh, trying to mix and match your uh, your vaccine to the strain that you think, you think are, are emerging uh, and hope that they line up. So it's a possibility. Um, we just don't know yet. Right. And you talked a little bit about testing and making sure that we contact trace. How are we doing with that here in the U.S. and in other countries worldwide? Uh, so in other countries, are doing great. Um, you know, in, in South Korea, they went back to school, um, right. which seems unheard of. Right. We got our cases at the same time uh, and we're all, you know, in, in our in our basements. Um, so uh, so th there's a real. Um, difference. And the difference is that they were ready to, uh, to test at scale and we weren't. And because we weren't, we, uh, we have fallen behind. And once you fall behind on a pandemic, you're going to stay behind. It's really, really hard to get ahead again. Um, and here we are. And so uh, testing right now, the kind of contact tracing testing that we would need uh, is just basically not happening. And um, we hope that once we get through the peak, that we'll be able to engage with contact tracing again so that um, so that it can uh, take place and take place at scale to, to, to keep the thing uh, from resurging. But, um, you know, that's an open question, especially with, with the leadership we have right now. And I think this is a great follow-up question. Divya asked, I, she wanted to know basically if there's any way at this point in, in, the, in the time frame to get ahead of the coronavirus anymore, or is it just going to be, you know, dealing with the aftermath and dealing with having a, a large peak? Um, you know, the nationwide peak is projected to be somewhere between the 17th and the 19th. So getting ahead of it before then, right. Which is like 10 days yeah. um, is likely not going to happen. Um, but, uh, but <coughs> bless you. <sighs> Thank you. Um, but, uh, but we hope that, um, that even, even, uh, despite having gone through the peak and, and done the worst of, um, you know, the, the worst damage that it's going to do in, in, in a particular period of time that, um, that we can get ahead of the aftermath. And what I mean by that is, um, we know that there's going to be a massive economic shock that comes as a result of COVID-19. Um, and so what do we do to make sure that people are whole, uh, through that and that we are empowering them, not necessarily corporations. Um, and, uh, what do we do to make sure that the mental health consequences of it um, you know, that there's not a huge long tail in terms of the mental health consequences and that we have the services to provide folks and that we institute contact tracing so that we don't have resurgence in cases. But, you know, um, 
th that's the hard part about a pandemic, right? Just like a fire. It's like decisions have to be made in the moment. And if you miss the decision opportunity, it's not like you can just go back. Right. Of course. And clearly we have to do better after, after the peak starts. And the CDC has given us a lot of advice, you know, maybe a little slowly at the beginning, but now they're suggesting that people wear cloth masks in public. Is that something that's worth doing? Because obviously people are still going out even to this day and probably will continue to do so. Is that something that's going to protect them or other people if they have the virus themselves? Yeah, I just I want to say something um, and I'll answer the question. But I do want to say wearing a mask is not in no way, never has been, never will be a replacement for proper social distancing. So if you're saying, you know, I'm going to put on a mask and then I'm just going to go out. No, wrong decision. Um, but if you're one of those folks who doesn't have the privilege of staying home right now, you're a frontline worker or uh, you work in a job that, you know, you, you have to choose between going out. Uh, and earning a livelihood or staying home and saving a life. Like, it's an impossible choice. And in that case, yes, a mask is the thing uh, that you can wear. Um, there's not much evidence on what the overall effect of masks are, but you know, there's no reason why it could hurt. And, um, and unless, of course, people are wearing them and then, not, and then going out, uh, or people are wearing them and like scratching their face the whole time, not the right thing to do. Um, but the mask in and of itself on your face, assuming no change in your behavior, is not going to hurt. And so it's not a bad thing to do. Um, just a couple of things that folks should make sure, you know, like wearing your mask on your, on your mouth and not your nose. Cause that defeats the purpose. Um, you're not, you know, wearing a mask one way and then reversing it and wearing it again later, the other way. So you're breathing in all the crap that you like kept from breathing in the first place. Um, that you're not, uh, you're not, you know, wearing a mask that will get you to, to, to scratch a lot. Um, but you know, other than that, you know, a, a, a cloth mask can be, um, you know, we think can be more effective than no mask. So why not? And I think the first part about, you know, social distancing can't be replaced. I think that's something that a lot of people still need to hear and listen to. Unfortunately, that's the case.